Welcome back to Politics and Land in Hawaii with Dennis Esaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Monarchy Atrask, Native Hawaiian attorney on development and utilization of Hawaii's natural beauty and resources. He is a fourth generation Native Hawaiian with legal background as well as uh, Native Hawaiian cultural concerns. He is a practicing attorney on Kauai in the areas of environmental law and mitigation, land use, zoning, and entitlements. The last time we spoke about Hawaiian issues, and now we would like to tie in Hawaiian issues, concerns, and land development. Mauna Kea, please tell us about your interest in Native Hawaiian perspective concerning the legal and ethical obligations of the state, the counties, and the activist community in regards to beneficial development. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Aloha, nice to see you again. Um, you know, basically my concern and what I like to talk about today addresses what I call beneficial development, which is in line with uh, Hawaii's constitutional public trust doctrine and Article 12, Section 7 of the Constitution regarding the protection and preservation of Native Hawaiian rights. I'm uh, traditional customary practices. Okay, so now we get a blend the two, uh, that, all that with development, uh, beneficial development, all that um, cultural uh, preservation. So how do we tie that in? Yeah, so <clears throat> good question. Um, when I'm talking about development here, it's it's really land use, and it's a really broad definition. So if you look at state law and county law regarding what constitutes development, I mean, it could be something as, you know, a redistricting of land, just something you do on paper, changing a map, to, to and until building a structure, building infrastructure, um, you know, whatever that is. And really the point being is, looking at and having a more nuanced view of what is beneficial development and more importantly what the real traditional and customary you know tenets of Hawaiian culture says about development and specifically you know modernly I think that people think that Native Hawaiians and Native Hawaiian culture sees development as categorically bad. There cannot be any good development. And it's just not true. It's not supported in, you know, history, culture, whether written or oral. And um, I, I think without appreciating and addressing these nuances, we, Native Hawaiians, you know, not, and Native Hawaiians and local people won't be able to continue to live in these islands, they won't continue to raise their families. They won't be here anymore. They'll be priced out, and um, you know we'll we'll just lose. We'll lose out. Yeah, the, the state and county has all these um, uh, mandates to uh, for all the development. Um, now the government has to cross the T's and dot the I's. Or else they will get shot down. Like uh, I think it was about ten years ago. Now in Kulo, there was a fifty lot subdivision. They built built out the roadways, graded the lots. I think they got all the approvals, and then when it was found out that they didn't meet all the requirements, then it got unsubdivided as it sits there now. So is that some like the things that we gotta? Tie everything together and get get it done. Yeah, I think you know. So, <laughs> pardon me. That Kaloa development is really controversial right now, and I don't I don't necessarily want to talk about that one today. <laughs> but I, I think more broadly speaking, that you know, first off, looking at the public trust doctrine, right? Article Eleven, Section One of the Hawaii State Constitution. And pardon me, I got my notes in front of me. So what it specifically says is for the benefit of present and future generations, 
the state and its political subdivisions shall conserve and protect Hawaii's natural beauty and natural resources, including land, water, air, et cetera, and shall promote the development and utilization of these resources in a manner consistent with their conservation and in furtherance of the self-sufficiency of the state. So what I'm saying today is not, and I don't mean to convey that, um, all development is good. What I'm trying to say is that all, all, not all development is bad. And with regard to, for lack of a better word, the activist community, I think that um, there needs to be, a, and this, I'm not speaking broadly, this is gonna come across broadly, I'm not speaking about all activists, but what's the perception is that there needs to be um, more, I think, responsibility and more nuance and honesty you know, to be to be clear or just to be blunt about the place of development in in um, you know how how native Hawaiians characterize that. So, for example, um, you look at like like really generally speaking, okay, it's water. Water is an extremely controversial issue, and it seems that th th there can be absolutely no beneficial and reasonable use of water if it involves diversion, right? It's extremely hard. And so so difficult that, you know, on Kauai, the East Kauai Water Cooperative up there in Wailua, when after Niki, when the uh, irrigation ditches blew out, and they never got repaired. And so the entire um, irrigation system on Kauai, which is what our ag lands you know, feed our ag lands and water our ag lands. It just, it, it's going to, we're going to lose it. And I don't think that's a good thing. And, and nor do I think that there's precedent for that in the native Hawaiian culture. When you, when you actually look at the facts, because Hawaiians were, I mean, probably the best engineers in Polynesia, you know, no one diverted water like us. You go into Kalalau and there's, diversions everywhere. There's low E all over the hillsides. And without that, we wouldn't, you know, Native Hawaiians wouldn't be able to live here. And so now it was done in the right way. And that's why I'm qualifying everything here as beneficial development. But for example, if, if KIUC wants to put hydro in a, in a river in order to decrease our dependency on diesel, to meet our 100% renewable energy portfolio, it's not categorically bad to do so. In fact, when you look at history, Kalakaua diverted, I mean, I had hydro in Nuuanu River in order to, you know, power Ilani Palace. And uh, my concern is that <clears throat> these commonly held misconceptions of the Native Hawaiian people and what they did is detrimental to our self-determination and ability to live and subsist in our own lands. And um, it, 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 oftentimes it seems like the Hawaiian culture is used to support an anti-development, um, you know, uh, anti-development program that doesn't benefit Native Hawaiians. And, and you know, another example, again, Kalalau, it's easier for somebody for recreational users to degrade that resource than it is for Native Hawaiians to maintain and preserve it and i think that's wrong yeah yeah, <clears throat> yeah. uh as you mentioned diversion it, it's a uh, uh, interesting topic uh there is a tunnel taking water from Hanole river going to the wailua side under the mountain i walked through there uh at one time they were going to do a hydro by wailua falls using that water that got shot down, um, probably rightfully so. Uh, now KAC is looking at hydro on West Kauai at Mana, but they're using it, recycling the water, pumping the same water back up and reusing it. So I think we're on the right track there. And they got some some of the permits. Um, yeah, diversion is a interesting thing. Um, so how does it affect some of the other uh, projects 
Are you familiar with something that the water department uh, uh, ruling came down from the Supreme Court? A similar, yeah. similar situation. Yeah, recently that was the, I think it was the um, Malka Lihui, right? The the 18 inch water right. main expansion or something like yeah. that. So, you know, I'm, I'm not intimately familiar with the facts of that case. I, I am aware of the case, though, and, and generally the proceeding. And that very well could be, you know, a, an example of that. So what I understand is, you know, the, the main person behind that push to shut that down. Well, first off, my understanding of that project, it is to support the expansion of Lihui to accommodate for more housing, more public infrastructure help Wilcox Hospital, you know, those, those kind of things. And um, it's a nuanced discussion. Yeah, all water in on Kauai comes from rivers and streams or, or wells and springs. But, yeah, so, okay. No, no, so they're a little bit concerned that, you know, they might be uh, concerned about fixing, fixing pipeline that taking water crossing district Aupua lines and stuff right now it's all tied in right yeah so exactly yeah. And, and not only that but i think a lot of the the people who my understanding is the prime mover behind that case doesn't even live in Lihue. you know they're not they don't reside in the puna district yeah. which traditionally and customarily that's not their kuleana you know and so it really matters what the people in those areas think and what they need. And, um, you know, it's it's a nuanced discussion, no doubt. But, you know, a lot of the stuff that was my understanding and those issues in that case was, like you said, it's a real technical challenge. So it was a, a challenge to an EIS, the age of it and whether or not appropriate disclosures were made and it was updated correctly. And a lot of these things are forefront of environmental and land use law. So a lot of these questions are have never been asked before. There's no answers. But when you're looking at the dire situation that Koi faces, you know, I think we need 9,000 housing units today in order to meet the need, much less what we need in the future. And so when we're facing something like that, I think it's disingenuous for somebody who is of retirement age and has their own home in another moku to challenge development and and things that are necessary to house present and future generations which is what the constitution says for the benefit of present and future generations right and i think you know to stop a project when it's not so clear that it's a bad project i think that the, the, there's a duty and responsibility for an honest critique and criticism and that if someone has a problem or an organization has a problem with the development, that's that's beneficial or can be seen as beneficial to work with and mitigate their concerns and not just simply stop it so you win in court and get attorney's fees. Um, okay, I don't know if we went into this the last time on the Kabakai analysis, um, which you know, the, the rules say you get to go all the way back, which to the original grant, some guys say like, it's kind of um, on the property that has been developed, you know, a few times before now, and you still got to go back. How do you see that uh, working? Yeah, no, good question. So, you know, Kapakai is, so basically, Kapa'akai in 2001, that case created a framework that public, you know, uh, the state and its political subdivisions could use to analyze whether or not there was, whether or not there were, and to the extent that that traditional customary practices occur on a, on a piece of property. And that's, you know, in Konohiki land, all, all title to, to all Konohiki land was subject to the rights of native tenants. That's clear. And so, but when you, when you look at that, it's a balancing test, right? It's not automatic. You get whatever you want. So there has to be a, a true traditional customary practice. And that is something that was established up until November 25th, 1892. That's the cutoff point. It's not 1778. 
So it, it protects more, I think, traditional customary practices that didn't simply pre-contact ones. And um, it, it provides, you know, you had identify whether or not there are traditional customary practices, the extent to which those practices are practiced, and um, what can be done to preserve, protect, or mitigate any adverse effect to them. But when a, when a property is fully developed, you, you no longer can exercise those practices. And, you know, the, the best case scenario, the, the best example is like anyone's house lot, right? Your, your house, your residential lot, my residential lot, any Native Hawaiian's residential lot, no one else can come over there if it's developed infrastructure, a home, it's fenced, et cetera, and, and trespass and exercise their rights. And so, um, and that's clear, you couldn't do that in uh, ancient Hawaii either, you know, whether pre-contact or post-contact. And I think the confusion is in this case, it, it's, yeah, when, when you're, if a, if a property is developed and you wanna, um, you know, repair your home or build another structure or haunt a unit or something like that, to, to have to go through another Kapaak analysis just doesn't make sense. It's already fully developed. And, um, but further, you know, it, it, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what that is. And I have personally seen instances where government agencies have required Native Hawaiians on Kuleana land, Kuleana house lots specifically, to conduct Kapa'akai analysis over the effect their home would have on the traditional customary practices of others, which in certain circumstances didn't make any sense whatsoever because frequently these people who are still lucky enough to have their Kuleana house lots are surrounded by non hawaiians You know, most of the land around them is owned by trusts or foreign corporations or, you know, Malahini. There's, there's no practices being taken place. And further in the Mahele, Konohiki land was subject to the rights of native tenants. House lots, Kuleana house lots weren't. I mean, in order to even obtain a Kuleana house lot, you had to show exclusive possession. So to, so to require a native Hawaiian, right, to hire a non-Hawaiian archaeologist or cultural consultant to ask other native Hawaiian, non-native Hawaiian neighbors <laughs> the effect that their Kuleana house will have on their, I mean, it makes no sense. And it, yeah. it just makes housing more expensive. And um, it doesn't protect the rights that it's is supposed to, you know. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I think when when the plantations came in, the large landowners, you know, they were, you know, they had to live with um, all these rights, Hawaiian rights, and all that. So some of them, a lot of them, had had it cleared up through the land court application process, which uh, cleared up all title, gave them, you know. So three final. Uh, um, how do you see that affecting things like this, or there's no effect? No, I, I think obviously there is. I mean, if something is registered land court, and that's it. There's no whatever rights are established, whatever the ownership is established, that's established. Um, and you know, when I tell people, you know, my my friends and and other people in Native Hawaiian community, I mean, like land court was created specifically to clear all that stuff up, right? Because Native Hawaiian law and land use law and property rights is extremely complex. But, you know, tying back to what, what was said earlier, um, I think that's, that's a lot has to do with a, a lack of outreach and honest presentation of what, what, the, the appropriate channels are and what duties and uh, duties and powers we have as native Hawaiians to participate and protect our resources. Like for example, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't consider myself pro development. I mean, I, uh, you know, my family background is it's, it's Hawaiian sovereignty. That's what it is. And I still, to this day, there's no greater historical injustice than what happens to native Hawaiians. And, and there's no, supreme justice than the self-determination of us right and um so when i grew up and i heard like the fake state argument right i fully bought it it's absolutely not true there's no precedent for it and there's specific case law to say that's not true hawaii state exists 
uh, the state of Hawaii is under the jurisdiction of the United States and the state of Hawaii, and Hawaiians are subject to their laws, for better or worse, that's what it is. But before I learned that, when I went to law school, I got the upside down flag tattooed on my chest. I'm not going to show it now. I got it. <laughs> and um, so I, you, I think did I'll, you go to Kamehameha School? Oh, 100%. Yeah. But did, when did I you went, go to Island School too? I did. I did, yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, that's in line with, I think, you know, but when I went, Kamehameha wasn't, I mean, people kind of chided me for being related to Hananike. You know, nowadays it's it's much further the other way. I mean, all my kids are against TMT, you know, Kukia Imana. And that's that's a change. But I think that, you know, in order to go forward as as a people, we need to understand what this really is. We we can't fight windmills. You know, we gotta fight the real fights. We gotta margin um, our resources and hit those points that matter. Otherwise, we lose credibility and we create really bad case precedent, you know, against us. Yeah, well, just a little bit more on, on uh, land car, because there's that's another step in the bureaucracy. Some people are deregistering it now, you know, so they can do the development faster. Um, but then they still got those cleared up rights, you know, up to that point. So they got it. Uh, adjudicated before and then now they take it out but then it's still uh there but then i think you got the still got the gathering rights and stuff still apply right oh yeah you know and and you know konahiki land for large yeah. undeveloped yeah. tracks yeah. land that's not fully de yeah. developed um th that's always in play and that's not a bad thing yeah it's not at all but you know an interesting thing about that and, and i'm not going to name specifics but you know a lot of this old land court property that's all old you know kama aina sugarcane family property right and, and a lot of them still hold it in uh family trusts or nonprofits, and they're land rich cash poor yeah. you know you know you know these people yeah. and um if they can't use their land and develop their land beneficially if everything they try to do gets stopped and it's too expensive for them to hold on to, they can't pay their taxes. Then the only person that's gonna come in and do it and, and buy it is gonna be a, a billionaire, a trillionaire, you know, whomever. And th that's a huge concern. You know, if, if for, like, you know, on, on Koi, there's a one-time ag subdivision, right? You only can subdivide ag land once after 1972. Well, there's a little bit side. Uh... Yeah. I mean, to that if you didn't maximize it true but but i mean yeah. generally speaking right yeah, yeah yeah and even if you can large tracts of ag land got to be i mean maintained right so so what that means is that no local person can afford to buy a 300 acre lag parcel absolutely not there's no water for that ag parcel so it can't be farmed and then therefore the only person that can pick it up when these families pass away or when they have to unload the, the, the property are people that, you know, a lot of people in the state don't like. And if we're not going to put Hawaiian land in local and Hawaiian hands, well, then it's going to get picked up by other people. And these are kind of the discussions that we need to have that, you know, we need to take pragmatic steps in order to make it to the next generation. Because otherwise, I tell you, we all get priced out. You know, and that's yeah. that's happening right now. Yeah. So you know, so is it still about Kamaaina versus the Malihini? And are you tainted if you eat in a bit the, the newcomers or you know the, the foreign quote foreign guys coming here? Well, you know, the, the history of Hawaii is coming and going, right? Yeah. I mean, people talk about time immemorial and ancient Hawaiians, when, when really, I mean, at the, at the oldest um, archaeological evidence, we're looking at, you know, 200 CE, right? 20 years, it was a third century. But in the more recent anthropological studies, we're looking at 700 to, to 1200 CE. So, I mean, that's, we're real recent. Um, we're, we're a modern, you know, young population culture. And um, 
people have been coming going forever. So I, I think it's more, I mean, I'm Native Hawaiian. I'm not saying that Native Hawaiians have land that's owed to them. We have certain political rights that are separate and apart from anybody else. Um, and and we, we're entitled to an indigenous government to government relationship with state and feds. But I mean, we all got, you know, non-Native Hawaiian relatives, parents, um, friends, There's nothing wrong with a, a, a non-Hawaiian. Right. I mean, I like you, Dennis, you're not Hawaiian. <laughs> That's hard. But um, again, it's, what I'm yeah. trying to encourage here is a more nuanced discussion yeah. about these things. Cause I know a lot of non-Hawaiians that love this culture. They love this place and they're allies. I mean, if it wasn't for Isaac Davis and John, yeah. Ye- um, yeah, John Young, Kamehameha wouldn't have won. You know, I mean, that's a that's a fact. Yeah, but then okay, we got uh, a lot of uh, exodus, <laughs> whatever to say. We're losing population here. Uh, I think they only print a net, but I think there's more guys going out and then some coming in. So I think there's more going out than you know what the net result printed in a paper. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, okay about is there's a talk about DHHL now so what do you think about uh, any thoughts on developing with DHHL and spending all that money they got 100% like um, so there, there, there's DHHL has land and more importantly they got one third of all water at six hundred million dollars now. In six hundred million dollars, exactly. There's absolutely no reason. I, I know Hawaiians that are living on the beach. You mean to tell me you can't put them on on a hula? Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean they're there. You got Hawaiians in Waianae living in the bushes. They you can't find any land for them. You got land. So, it's it's doable. There's no way. I mean, they're they're two steps ahead of the game, at the giddy up. And more importantly, we can't forget that Prince Kuhio put aside those lands for Native Hawaiians with at least 132nd. That's 3% Native Hawaiian. The fact that 50% is there now, that's horse trading in Congress. That he had to do, and it's amazing that he did it because in 1920s he had no vote. He was a territorial rep, so that was it. But you gotta put Hawaiians on that land, man. This is our land. We, we deserve to live there. And, and and also that would, if you did that, you'd do a huge, benefit to addressing the homelessness population because oftentimes we're the one who's homeless so there's a lot of i hear a lot of reasons why we can't but we need solutions why we can you know that's what we need we need leadership okay uh thanks monica running out of time any last words um no i i think i appreciate the time and i and i i think that there needs to be a space for these conversations and for Native Hawaiians to be people and have opinions that are more nuanced than just anti-development and or, you know, one one dimensional. We're multi-dimensional people. It's a multi-dimensional culture. And um, these, these are serious questions we need to address now because there's not a future for us if we don't. Yeah. And and on the other side, the developers got to, you know, have some uh, aloha for the land. Oh, yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, mahalo to our guests, Mauna Kea Tras, and the Native Hawaiian uh, perspective on the balance between land use development and Native Hawaiian concerns. Mahalo to our viewers on Think Tech Hawaii. If you like the Think Tech free media shows, please help support this nonprofit platform. Aloha, ahui ho, malama pono. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.